look outside and I see the weather changing. The rain getting worse than it ever was before. This is Ireland. I see places all over the world changing, including places I've visited, like West Bengal, which is now under threat. I want to know how seriously the leaders of the world are taking this. All right, straight to the point. John setting the scene for us. Just how important is a deal on climate change and how uh, seriously, Evo, are world leaders taking this? Actually, I didn't know the rain could get any worse in Ireland, but it, <laughs> it seems it is. I, I think they are. I've never seen a moment in history when so many world leaders have taken an interest in this topic. We have 115 of them on the way to Copenhagen at the moment to be here on Friday and make sure that we get a strong, resounding result out of this meeting. Daryl, you impressed or unimpressed? Well, it's definitely a defining moment for politicians and world leaders to, to, to take a stand to make real change in moving beyond a fossil fuel economy into a new uh, energy independent and a new energy economy, basically. Um. Uh, you know, my own take is that uh, what happens here is certainly important. It could inspire a lot of action around the world, but um, I tend to take a more America focus. If the United States doesn't get involved with this and take the lead, I don't think we can really solve a scale problem like this. Mm. And um, right now, I think that that's still very much up in the air. Bill? Well, there's a lot of buzz. And as uh, Ivor said, 115 leaders are coming to Copenhagen. But what are they actually going to agree on? They're basically going to agree on making lots of carbon cuts, which they've agreed on for the last 18 years. And they've failed for the last 18 years. So I think we possibly want to ask, don't you want to do something smarter and something different that would actually work this time? Well, I want to discuss all of what you've been brought up as we move through this next hour. Not everyone, of course, though, buys the notion of man-made climate change. The issue is not black and white. Listen to what Felix from Germany has to say. Hello, everybody. I'm asking myself why people don't recognize movies like The Great Global Warming Swindle, where scientists all over the world doubt that humans caused the change of our climate. Climate is changing since millions of years, again and again, and the mainstream media ignores scientific facts and real knowledge about the actual development. You're scaring people. You're putting them under pressure. You're making them feel guilty. Making us feel guilty. It's a good start, this discussion early, I think. For many of us, the climate gate email scandal is still fresh in the mind. And a lot of people remain unconvinced that this is a man-made problem. So let's nail this earlier on. Um, Bjorn, sympathetic to what Felix says? Well, I think there's some truth to what he's trying to portray. Let's just get this fixed, and I think that I speak for all four of us here. Global warming is real, it's man-made, it is an important problem. What we do need to recognize is that the incessant move to just saying there's only one solution, namely cut carbon emissions, and it's going to be expensive for you, is actually making a lot of people turn around and say, I don't want to be part of this. And that's what makes people, and we see this in polls around the world, that people are turning more skeptical. A lot of people are saying they don't believe in it. That's wrong but I see why it's happening, and we need to move people back from that. We need to say, this is about making smart policies, not ones that won't work and that will just cost a lot. Tom? Well, I don't think this is that complicated. Uh, the planet is enveloped in uh, a blanket of greenhouse gases. That's what keeps our, our planet nice and perfect temperature for us to inhabit it. Uh, it's made up of CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases. As we pump more in, um, it will trap more heat, um, melt more ice, raise more sea levels. We, we, we know that. Mm. What we don't know is what other feedbacks could happen, what other things could ameliorate. The climate system is the question. It's very complicated. We don't know everything. When will hit red lines? But here's what we do know. That greenhouse gas up there that's going to trap that heat stays there for hundreds, if not thousands of years. That means, okay, that what we're doing if it is leading to a catastrophic outcome, once it starts, it can't be stopped. So when I see something that has some chance a high degree of irreversibility and some chance of being catastrophic, mm -hmm. what I do, I buy insurance. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what this is all about. The, the uncertainties around climate change are not a reason not to act. They're a reason to act. Mm. Either just on the back of that. Agree? 
Well, first of all, to reassure Bjorn that he's not speaking on my behalf, um, I, th I, think that this, I think that this is a very serious issue. If I, if I were to go out in this country and buy a packet of cigarettes, it probably says on it, smoking may cause your death. May cause your death. It doesn't say will cause your death. Is that a reason to assume that smoking is, uh, is safe? I think we have an abundance of very robust scientific evidence that tells us we're in deep trouble and something has happened that, contrary to what was raised in the question, has not happened to us in the past. And we need to act on it, not in one simple way, that's what makes it so complicated, but in a multitude of ways, by looking at the lifestyles of people, by looking at how we move ourselves around, by looking at how we make the products that we like to consume. It's a complicated issue. Yeah, there are 400 million people who don't even have access to electricity. They can't switch off the light they haven't got and they're probably saying, get greedy now. So how can you get people, these people, to grow their lives, grow their economies in a way that is more sustainable? Mm. And the other side of the equation is how can you get people that, that are wealthy, that are affluent at the moment, to, to live their lives in a much more sustainable way? And there I think technology is critical, and technology will only come if policies and prices drive that into the market. All right, well, let's talk about that next because uh, we're going to get to the United States, a pivotal player in any climate change conversation and a nation that prides itself on individual liberty. Sean's video, one of the most highly viewed and top ranked according to the Google moderator, questions the validity of a global carbon tax. Sean's question. Howdy YouTube, howdy world. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm 29 years old. Everything that I've seen so far with your treaty deals more on the level of the ordinary person and what they have to do to stop global warming. And my question to you is why has it never been the giant corporations who put these chemicals into the atmosphere, who pollute the lakes and who pollute the rivers and the air? And from what we can even tell with global warming, especially since all these emails just got exposed, 10,000 emails plus exposed showing how they've been doctoring their numbers and we can see how they've been wording things certain ways to make it, uh, to make it appealable for their viewpoint. My question to you is why, why taxes are the answer? That's, that's my question. Why are taxes the answer and why is it us, the little guys, have to pay those? Thank you. Uh, COP15, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, God bless, and, and let's, you know, let's save the earth, but, you know, I don't think you need to tax us to do it, so. All right. Makes it pretty obvious <laughs> what he does and doesn't want there. Thomas. Well, what I'd say to Sean is um, uh, if you don't think that uh, your gasoline price being set by the world's biggest cartel for the last 35 years isn't a tax, then you're not paying attention, okay? So if I want to put a tax on, t on, on gasoline in America mm -hmm. to stimulate uh, movements to smaller, more fuel-efficient cars, yeah, that's a tax, sure. Mm -hmm. But I'd like my taxes to go to my treasury to pay for U.S. schools, U.S. hospitals, U.S. roads, U.S. research. It's a little tick I have. I don't like my taxes to go to pay for some of the most authoritarian regimes in the world who have drawn a bullseye on my back. So if you don't think you're paying a tax already, you're not paying attention. It's where the tax goes to which treasury. I know you don't even buy a carbon tax, do you? Why not when you hear what well, uh, no. uh, Thomas is saying? I would agree, and every economist, uh, climate economist would agree that we do need a carbon tax, but we should just not fool ourselves. That's not enough to drive the a revolution. It's it a good might, start, surely, it, isn't it? It might actually fund, the, uh, uh, fund, for instance, research and development, but a, a $7 carbon tax, which is going to translate into $6 per, per gasoline, uh, uh, sorry, six cents per ga uh, gallon of gasoline, it's just not going to make it. Of course, if we really try hard, we might actually see people switch off like Sean and say, I'm not going to pay for that. And so what we do need, we're not going to get the huge carbon taxes that people would like to see. What we will need is to get the better technology that will enable us to actually have, for instance, uh, uh, electric cars or other things that don't pollute in the long run. Eva, I know it's been a long couple of weeks. <laughs> You're shaking your head again. Uh, what Bjorn's saying, why? Well, I mean, if, if, if Bjorn is, is advocating a tax, it's probably because he knows it's never going to happen. 
uh, because there would be massive resistance against it. I think, I think that the video was actually absolutely right. It's a matter of, this, of finding a mechanism that gets the big polluters to pay for polluting. What is that mechanism, though? Well, I, th I think that that is... Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great advocate of taxes, but I'm, I'm not an economist. Uh, I do pay tax. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm much more an advocate of a, of a, of a cap-and-trade approach, whereby you say to a company, if you want to make something for consumers, fine, but you're going to have to clean up your own mess after you uh, and, and buy the right to pollute.